you. <laughs> oh God. Um good evening, everyone. Um welcome to the I guess it's November. No, it's October. Good God. Um meeting of the racial disparities advisory panel. Um I will we'll start with introductions. I will do as we normally do and go through my screen and say your name and please introduce yourself when I do. Erin. Good evening, everybody. Erin Jacobson. I use she, her pronouns, and I work at the Community Justice Unit of the Attorney General's Office. Great. I'm Eitan Nasred Longo. I use masculine pronouns. Derek. Hi, good evening, everyone. Derek Miodevnik, he, him. I am uh, the representative from the Department of Corrections to the RDAP. Nice to see you folks. Thank you. Hello, Tyler. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tyler Allen. I use he, him pronouns. I, uh, For the sake of the quorum and other things, I am still DCF's representative on this group. <laughs> Um, and I think DCF's sole representative tonight. Usually Elizabeth yeah. is here with me, but she uh, could not be here tonight. She has uh, she has some other pressing matters. Yeah. Susanna. Hi, everybody. Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. She's serious pronouns and a member of the working group. Great. <laughs> Judge Morrissey. Hi, thank you. I, my screen looks so fuzzy. I apologize for that. Um, my name is Mary Morrissey. I'm the judiciary's representative on this panel. I use she, her pronouns. Thank Great. you. Tiffany. Hi there. Tiffany North Reed. Oh, gosh. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> I work with ORE and um, I um, support the um, Division of Racial Justice uh, Statistics. Great. Uh, she, her. Yes. Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Carter. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a data analyst in the Division of Racial Justice Statistics within the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Thank you. Sheila. Sheila Linton, she, her, her, hers, um, panel member and um, community, the Root Social Justice Center. Thank you. Tim. Tim Leers Dumont in the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. I use he, he him uh, pronouns, and good to see everybody. Great. Jen Furpo. No. Hi, Jen Furpo from the Vermont Police Academy. I use she, her pronouns. Lovely to be here. Great. Witchy. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Witchy Artu, pronouns he, him, his. And I am health equity and data systems consultant and expert uh, appointed to this committee by Susanna Davis and the Office of Racial Equity. <laughs> Morning, Witchy. Where are I'm you? I'm just I'm just trying to see if people are paying attention, you know, keeping oh, it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I thought thanks for paying attention. <laughs> that was a really good save, actually. Uh <laughs> Judge Davenport. Hi, I'm uh Amy Davenport. I'm a retired Superior Court judge and I sit on the Council for Equitable Youth Justice. Great. Thank you. Representative Arsenal. Oops. Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Angela Arsenault, representative from Williston, and I am on the House Judiciary Committee, so here really to listen in. Thank you. Jennifer Pullman. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pullman. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. I'm just here to listen, and I'm going to stay off camera because I've been sick all day, so I'll spare you the way that I look. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pepper, long time uh, no see. The one who runs the Vermont Crime Victim Service, Center for Vermont Crime Victim Service. Oh. <laughs> hey, uh, James Pepper, I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board, former, you know, member of this committee and uh, just listening in today, but um, I just heard the, uh, my four-year-old twins come home, so I'm going to also turn myself on mute and stop my videos in case things get up crazy at the pepper house. <laughs> okay. 
And last but not least, Reverend Mark Hughes. Hey, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. And um, a time welcome back. It is really good to see you. Thank uh, you, Mark. Thank you. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. And I'm also the co-chair of the Health Equity Advisory Commission. I'm a former member of this uh, this panel as well. Glad to be with you all tonight. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, announcements are short. Uh, it's basically regrets. Um, Don Stevens will not be with us tonight, um, Chief Don, and neither will, as Tyler said, um, Elizabeth Morris. She had some family obligations to which she had to attend. So, but she expresses complete confidence in Tyler. <laughs> to yeah, <laughs> Tyler's like yeah maybe. Uh, um, but in any event, so that will be great. We'll get there in a moment. Um, let us begin with the minutes that were sent out from the last meeting, September 2023. Any discussion, addenda, errata, anything that needs to be discussed? No? OK. Seeing none, then shall we move on to a vote? Somebody want to move? I move to approve last meeting's agenda minutes. Great. Thank you. Okay, Wonderful. Seconded. Therefore, all in favor, please signify by some interesting way. Aye. Aye. Yep. Aye. 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 Got it. All opposed? All abstaining? Aye. Okay. Got it. Thank you. But the minutes have passed as submitted. Thank you. Um, moving right along, we're going to get on to the presentations and the discussions, which is really the body of the meeting. Um, Tyler? We start with you, I guess, with the Juvenile Justice Subcommittee. Um, you'll all recall from the note that I sent out um, with the agenda and the uh, whatever they're called, minutes, um, we need to start pivoting to writing. So I really want everyone to start going, you know, like, here's a bullet point we're going to bring up. Here's a bullet point. I mean, even if there's like not a paragraph attached to it, I just want to start. This has got us. We've got to start sketching it out. This is where, for those of you who are around in 2019, I turn into the professor that I really am. And it gets scary. So, um, Tyler, the stage is yours. Uh, well, thank you, Aton. Um, I will do my level best as Elizabeth has expressed her confidence. Um, uh, but you know that we've been working actually pretty closely together on this conversations. We've had several the the juvenile justice subcommittee has met several times um, in in different variations. Um, that subcommittee being myself, Elizabeth Morris, and Rebecca Turner, who I'm kind of sad to see is not here um, yeah. right now. She might be joining at some point. Aton, we did have the fortune of meeting with you. Um, I think Rachel Edens was in that conversation too once where we went through a lot of the substance of this. So, And that was helpful for us in terms of organizing this. I'll start off with, a, with an apology. I did not put this into paragraph written form or even bullet points that we can start with writing, but we did put it into a PowerPoint. Um, I think the idea was to be kind of digestible so that we could show the data, we could walk through it. Um, I'll be jotting down notes as I kind of run through this and we have conversation and then I can easily turn that into kind of either narrative or prose form, however you all prefer it, um, they can go into a report. So I think getting the substance of it in a visual format was what we thought would be most helpful. So if cool. it's okay, I'm not actually super familiar. Oh, there's share screen. Um, I'm not as Zoom comfortable, but I'm going to give a shot. Ooh. All right. 
Can you all see that? Uh huh. Excellent. I will put it in the. All right. Wow. Look at this. Give subtitles a try. Is that something you all are seeing? I don't want to. All right. It there says we go. RJAP JJ <laughs> subcommittee. There we go. So that's us. Um, we'll start out with the kind of one, you know, one of the primary things. I don't know if it's not fr framed in uh, this presentation as recommendations. It's more the conversation we've been having. Um, and it is for you all to think about. I think depending on how this group hears this information and where the interest is, um, we can make decisions on whether or not we want to write this out as recommendations. But the starting point is uh, the discussion of what the minimum age of juvenile court jurisdiction is. Um, when we're talking about juvenile court. Of course, we're talking about family court, but juvenile court is more understandable. This is referring to delinquencies. So Vermont has a minimum age of ju juvenile court jurisdiction uh, of 10. So kids under the age of 10 years old cannot be charged in the family court as a delinquent. Um, there is one carve out exception to that, that carve out exception being murder. Um, as you can imagine, it is very rare that a youth, a child under the age of 10 would be charged with murder. And it would be exceptionally rare to kind of, um, you know, to prove that they would, that would be murder. It's very unlikely. Um, but that's the only carve out, uh, in my understanding B beyond that, you know, 10 is the, 10 is the minimum. There was conversation last session, um, to raise this to 12 years old, um, and that that the bill that passed that had other elements to it, but that was one of the elements in it of what is about raising the the minimum age of juvenile jurisdiction to to twelve. And so um, I'm glad Judge Davenport is here with us today. We actually had some of this conversation this morning in a different meeting. Um, but the Council for Equitable Youth Justice um, has supported this increase. It is something we've uh, you know we still have talked about and we're still thinking about. I imagine it will be something that the legislature is looking at again this year. Um, and the objective here uh, for the purpose of this presentation is to have an understanding of what the RDAP stance is mm -hmm. um, and what we would like to do. Let's see. Great. So this is the way the country looks. Uh, I think I misspoke to you at one point, Aton. I had said the majority of the country um, is ahead of Vermont in this. I was right. mistaken um, in this. This shows kind of a color coding of where the country's at. It looks like about half the country doesn't have a minimum age of delinquent delinquency jurisdiction. Um, and then you'll see the different ages. You have those uh, that, you know, it looks like Florida has age seven. There are certain carve outs. Then Washington, age eight with certain carve outs. Um, and then there's a handful age tens. And those are the yellow ones. Uh, Nebraska is at age 11. There are no carve outs on those. We are in the category um, along with the other yellow polka dotted ones, whereas age 10, where we have the one carve out for murder. Um, and then some other states around around us, Connecticut is one that's kind of similar. We are often fairly close in policy to Connecticut. They're also at age 10. But New York, you'll notice New York and Massachusetts, who are often aligned with in terms of similar matters, they are at age 12, either with a carve out in the case of New York. Um, also, Utah and California, Massachusetts um, is strictly at age 12. So any any young person under the age of 12 um, cannot have a delinquency in that state. New Hampshire um, is along with, it looks like Maryland, uh, at age 13. So New Hampshire, and they have carve outs built into that. Okay. So that's kind of where the country sits. We're probably in the top part of that. If you're looking at it from the perspective of we have protections, um, for for some youth, but we're certainly not aligned at present with some of the states that we most closely kind of uh, connect to on on similar matters, like like Massachusetts, New York, New Hampshire. Okay. Witchy has a question. Oh, go ahead, Witchy. 
Thank you, Eitan. Uh, my, my question is, what kind of research has been found on uh, benefits and detriments to uh, children being incarcerated uh, with an age variance in that research? I'm um, probably I don't know if there's anybody from the crime research group on tonight that I don't think I heard anybody. I don't know that I could speak to what research is search is available, um, but I can speak, you know, to generally as we're, you know, taking a carceral approach with young people um, is uh, challenging, um, uh, uh, challenging to obtain kind of good, good results. I do. I could speak to the older youth because um, I have been, you know, I, I have followed the Raise the Age initiative when we're talking kids on the older end of the spectrum. And a lot of that research supports the idea when you incarcerate kids who are otherwise developing, um, you actually are more, you know, more likely to solidify criminogenic behavior. So often you have factors that they're more likely to become entrenched factors um, and I see Judge Davenport just raise her hand, so I'm going to let her chime in, too, because I know she has some thoughts on this. Um, but that's the, the general con the general idea that we've been going with was if you're if you're incarcerating kids that still have a developing brain, they're more likely to become entrenched in the behavioral patterns you're looking to 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 move them away from or have them move away from. And in some cases, doing nothing at all is better than overreacting or in many cases with a juvenile brain. So I'd 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 move that to Amy to see what you'd like to add to that. Um, uh, yeah, I would just add the numbers are incredibly small for looking at, we, we have looked at the data, um, the, the council for equitable youth justice has looked at the data for, um, uh, charges that have been brought against, uh, 10, 11, and even 12 year olds. And the numbers are really, really small. So it's very hard to draw and I expect the same is true for a lot of states. It's really hard to draw conclusions from those numbers. Um, but if you think about many of the offenses uh, for which uh, uh, one might be charged, um, they, in, they include an intent factor uh, or an intent element. Um, very hard to prove intent. Um, when you're talking about uh, uh, a 10, 11, even a 12 year old, actually, but uh, certainly a 10 and 11 year old. So um, but but so there's not there's not a lot of data and we don't really uh, we don't really have uh, national data on, um, you know, for example, Florida, if you notice that Florida is age seven um, with carve outs uh, for lower than that. Um, I, I, I would, I don't know what their data is about what happens to the kid, you know, how, how many kids actually ever get charged and how many of those kids ever, um, end up in a secure, in a secure facility. Um, they, I mean, that's the other part of your question really is what happens to those kids when they're in a secure facility, given that young age, the likelihood that they're going to go to a secure facility, even to start with, even if, the minimum age was you know, if they met the minimum age requirement and um, there was a convict, you know, there was a disposition uh, unlikely that they're going to go to a secure facility um, because of their because of their young age and because of the recognition of how detrimental it can be. Okay. Thank you, Judge. And I do want to share that we have the some data slides coming up, too. So you all will be, well, be able to see some of that. Um, Richie, do you have I, another? I, yeah, I, I I appreciate the comments. I I'll, I'll just say a few bits of things that stood out to me and let you carry on with either other questions or the presentation. The first one is um because I kind of had a counter question to your comment, Tyler, about the fact that you know it, that research shows that if you're incarcerating developing brains, it kind of solidifies the behavior and recognizing the fact that in, uh, in modern science, it's understood that brains are still developing till about 27 years old. Mm -hmm. So just really um, putting that into perspective, uh, but uh, to, to Judge Davenport's uh, point of proving intention that sort of balances out, I think that, or counteracts that argument. Um, I also want to note about uh, 
juvenile justice system and the and just thinking about the reinforcing of behavior and thinking about the disparities within our adult incarceration system and remembering that you know we do still have that's or else in school right we are by far population skews younger so um just things to think about that popped into my brain that i thought i should share into the space thank you I appreciate your sharing that, Witchy. And I would say, honestly, your first point, I don't see that as a counterpoint. I'm I'm agreeing with you on that, that the developing, you know, brains do continue to develop in, in many ways. They continue to develop throughout throughout life. Um, but but there is a distinct difference uh, up to 25, 27 years old. And I absolutely agree with you. Um, so I think as you get younger, it only becomes more true <laughs> in my in my opinion and view. Um, of that. Uh, so thank you. I think those are excellent points. Uh, and I appreciate you bringing it up. And this is really focused on just how we're into, we're talking about those younger youth with this first part of it. Um, here's some of the data. These Wait, one are... minute, oh. Tyler, let me, yeah. there's just one question, I think, before oh, sure. we go to the slides, Sheila. Thank you, Eitan. Appreciate that. Um, so I had a similar sort of comments to Witchy a little bit. I was just sort of curious. I was also going to mention about the brain developing until about the age of 25 and wondering if there is specific research of brain development around intent. Like, you know, does intent in brain research start developing at the age of 10? Or does it start at three years old? Or does it start from birth? Like why I'm a little, I'm, I'm kind of curious since we're talking about data and statistics and we're talking about the brain development, then I would be like, then, oh, then nobody should be charged 25 and under, right? If the brain's still really developing. But then there's this caveat of this intent or intentionality. And I'm sort of curious if anybody has some knowledge specifically around brain development and intent. And then the other question I had was, um, around the racial makeup of those other states and what um what is the racial makeup of those other states and why they may have a lower number versus a higher number um and how those sort of coincide with each other and is it disproportionate or not disproportionate but is it reflected in a way of sort of what I think which he was um, alluding to one of, of one of the things he was saying was that, you know, in different areas of populations are racially different. And so seven in Florida, maybe, you know, if it's more racially um, diverse might be a reason why that has a lower number than let's say something like I'm, I'm not reading the thing, but something um, that doesn't. So I just have some curiosity around those two things. I would I would certainly I appreciate those uh, comments too, Sheila. I I think um, I I'm not an expert in this arena, and I don't know what the makeup is across those states. I will say that um, the intent question. Well, before getting to the other states, I'll talk about the. I think the conversation of what uh, Judge Davenport was talking about with in, with regard to intent is kind of a legal distinction. It's a it's a, a standard that a judge needs to find in order to issue finding or issue, issue ruling. So, if you have a charge type, you have to prove that a this person did this and this di person did this with intention. And I think at some point that's a judgment. I don't know quite what the data is around connecting the legal the law of that um and and how a judiciary any judiciary views intent um and where that's grounded in science or not i don't know judge davenport if you have any insight to that um but it's a fascinating question you're, you're muted you're yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Um, I can give you an example of a case that I had involving a 10-year-old, um, I think she was 10 years old, maybe 11 years old girl who was charged with assault because she threw a truck at her brother, uh, a toy truck, a small toy truck. She threw it at her brother who was three. Um, I That charge got dismissed because a 10-year-old can't really form the intent to harm in the in the same way that the, an, an adult would form an intent to form harm. I think the thing to understand about um, the development of the brain is that there are stages to that. And yeah, maybe a 16 or 17 year old could understand intent to harm the three year old by throwing the truck. But a 10 year old um, probably isn't developmentally 
able to do that. Um, so I, I think that, yes, we can talk about development, but development comes in stages. And we know that um, that the stage, the developmental stage of a 10 year old is way, you know, they're just on a spectrum. It's on a spectrum and that that they're um, that is a big difference between the developmental stage of a 10 year old and the developmental stage of a 16 year old, uh, for example. Um, they may a 16 year old doesn't have a fully developed brain. That's true. Um, but it's it, it is it is certainly more developed than the 10 year olds. Um, so you, I think that and, and Tyler's right that the intent factor, that's just an element of a crime of a lot of crimes is that they have to have an intent to actually harm. OK, I, I, I guess to Sheila's point um, and your, your comments, Judge Davenport, is that um, if it's a judgment call, right, we're leaving we're, we're leaving that judgment to the judge. Right. And all, not all judges will think the same. So I think part of maybe what Sheila's trying to get at, um, and Sheila, correct me if I'm wrong, is that our job as a legal advisory board is to say, right, at 10 years old, you don't you do not have the development of intent and therefore you should not. Right. Um, versus leaving it up to the bias of whatever person is is judging that act and judging the the, the kid. Right. Although the, te the the judge may well be informed by expert opinion on the subject. I mean, it's not like you're totally uh, I, 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 I that was my case. I think I dismissed it without even going to the lengths of having an evidentiary hearing about whether this child could have had the intent or not. I just suggested that maybe this wasn't the right way to approach things. Um, and they followed my suggestions. So I'm happy to say. But um but you, you you could theoretically, if it was really a sticking point between the attorney, the state's attorney and the attorney for the child, you could very easily ha end up with a evidentiary hearing where you heard from uh, psychologists who gave expert opinion about uh, the 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 intent. So it's not it's not just a total, you know, conclusion by the the, the judge on their own based on their own knowledge. Yeah, that was the other thing I was thinking is which he was uh, framing that um, question was um, there is subjectivity to human development too, child development. We all develop differently in different ways too, which is why there is a case by case element to this. But I think we the purpose of this conversation is to step back a little and say, generally speaking, when we're talking about 10 and 11 year olds, intent is really difficult to prove on any of these. And how many kids are we really talking about and who are we really talking about? And that's what I was hoping to get to um, with some of these data slides. Yeah. Um, Why don't you just go ahead, Tyler. Okay. And so, so I'll, I'll move us into this slide. This is um, DCF data. Um, you'll see these are the number of cases. These are um, ages 10 through 12. So this isn't just 10 and 11 year olds with that, with that bill had proposed, but it also includes 12 year olds. And these are the, these are cases that actually are in DCF system. Um, either have, they have a delinquency, those DCs, these are delinquent cases in our custody. Those DP cases are um, delinquencies. They're on probation only. They're not in DCF's custody. And those DYs are delinquencies that are um, they're pending a petition. So they're 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 going to go one way or the other. So the grand total in all of those years of how many cases and these are this is duplicated data is 21 cases that we're talking about of DCF cases. And some of those might be cases that spanned over years. So counted twice, so on and so forth. So I guess what I'm pointing to is these are small numbers that actually make it to DCF. Um, and the next slide will get us one degree, you know, this is there will be before DCF, this is court data. Um, these are the number of juvenile cases filed. Now, this data we were able to extract and break apart by race. Um, and so that's where it becomes particularly meaningful for this group to me. Um, 
small numbers. We're talking about 43 cases total um, between 10, 11, and 12-year-olds. We've included 12-year-olds in this data set just because we included that in the last slide too. Um, and you'll notice it jumps up quite a bit when we're talking about 12-year-olds. There's 31 cases there as opposed to 11, 11-year-olds, 1, 10-year-old. And I think this is just for the last year. Um, so this is a much smaller um, number of cases. One of the things that occurred to me as I was looking at the slide, and Judge Morrissey, I'll, 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 I'd love to get to your question in just a moment, but I want to get this thought out, is these are actually filed cases. Um, this isn't factoring in kids who might have an intervention with a law enforcement officer or something where the state's attorney never files a petition. This doesn't get to the point of case. You know, there might have been a traumatic experience where there is a law enforcement interaction that never turns into a case. And we're not seeing any of those data. We're not seeing the number of youth who are, for, for example, arrested for a, a quote unquote delinquency. Um, but these are relatively small numbers. And then, and I, before I get to the questions, I just wanted to show the breakdown of, um, of how we break it down. When we're looking at those 11 year olds in the state of Vermont, you know, we had five white 11 year olds or five charges. I shouldn't say they're distinct. Um, I think these are distinct cases, not distinct, um, individuals, so there might be some that are have repeated charges attached to them, which is a whole nother conversation. But, you know, equal amounts, white and black 11 year olds that were charged. Um, and then we have an unavailable blank column, which, again, is its own conversation. So um, I see Judge Morris, you put your hand down, but I have I'm hoping that you still have a question or a thought you'd like. Well, to. My question was what you just barely raised was if it's uh -huh. if it's cases or individuals. So, you know, looking at this, for example, it could have been one black 11 year old and one white 11 year old who committed five crimes together. Right. Correct. I mean, right. I mean, it. so I, that was and you just answered that question about whether or not it was charge or individual. So that was my question. So thank you. Yep. You're welcome. And I will say that when we tried to, we didn't the number we the the data we had, we didn't have too much identifying information, but we tried to take an educated guess at it. Um, in this case, I think it was one black individual with multiple charge types um, and then all separate white individuals for the others. So again, that raises questions of, do we have one young person who is um, really reckless and wild or has really attracted the attention of law enforcement in the community or the ire of the local charging, but you know, we don't know, we don't know that data, um, but that also, those also raise questions. And I think for us, there is some merit to this idea. While these, this N is so small, these numbers, you can't do um, really meaningful analysis with numbers this small. Um, it, it does, seem to suggest at least anecdotally that there is a disproportionate response when we're talking to youth of color. And I think that tracks with what we know nationally of uh, our kind of American propensity to adultify um, youth of color uh, more than 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 white youth. And so again, I don't I can't say that from a evidence-based science perspective, but it seems to be aligned with some of that thinking. Witchy. Uh, witchy. Uh, I got three questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, the first question is, do we know if when the data was collected that they were allowed to click multiracial as a choice? Uh, I am not sure about that. These is This is from the, I think it's called the Somebody else on this might know better, but it's the 101, is it? The Form 101 that's filled out. And I think um, that it's left blank in situations. It's not required that it's that it's completed. We actually have a slide that touches on this um, in the next okay. slide or two. All right. Uh, there, is my... no, there is no multiracial, there is no multiracial option. It's white, black, Asian, but there's no multiracial. Currently, there's no multiracial option in the court data. Okay, that's that's good and interesting to note. Um, 
the second question is, do we know um, the proportion to the amount of children that are in Vermont? So like, you know, 26 out of blank white children and five out of blank black children. Uh, we haven't looked at the data in that way. Um, uh, and again, these are cases filed, not individual children. Got it. So, so it wouldn't, we probably couldn't do that with these data. Right. Got it. And, um, uh, yeah, cause I think that would, that would give us uh, also like an idea of, uh, if the disparity is similar to the adult court and, uh, the other thing that I want to mention is like because these are cases and not individuals, I and I don't know if this is what Judge Morthy was trying to get at. Um, I'm sorry if you were and I'm repeating, but um, I guess this doesn't tell us how many juvenile individuals were charged in adult um, case as adults, right? None of none of these would have been charged as adults. They couldn't be. I believe. Yeah, they couldn't be at the ages they are. They couldn't be at that age. Oh, at that age. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And again, these numbers are quite quite small, so it's drawing too many com conclusions about how this lines up to everything. It would be probably statistically impossible to get there with such a small n, but it does tell us something about communities. I also, I, the thought I had, and I'll go back to what I said earlier, is we're not talking about interventions pre-filing a case. So you all along between the case being filed and the quote unquote delinquency occurring, there are avenues by which they could be diverted, right? Like they could, the, the law enforcement officer can say, I'm going to not respond to this in this way. I'm going to take this kid home or I'm going to give him a, you know, a stern finger wagging and move past. Um, a state's attorney could get it and decide I'm not going to file for this because it's going to be very unlikely to prove it. So I'm just going to drop this at this point. So we don't know what's happening in all any of level of those interventions here. We just know what the court actually gets with these. So there could be more if we were to, for example, raise the age of minimum um, jurisdiction, family court jurisdiction, there could be a broader impact in that arena when you have law enforcement that says, I can't charge this youth at this age, right? So that that there might be an impact there too, which I can't speak to. I don't have those data. Tim? Hey there. Sorry, my internet is shaky, so I'm just going to leave my camera off. Um, and I would just because you brought it up again, Tyler, I wanted to just pause on that for a second because what you're talking about is the improvisational space between contact with law enforcement or an initial kind of report or someone calling the police because police respond to calls, um, but also are sometimes embedded in schools as well. It sort of you know depends looking at this population. Um, you know, we're not talking about the high school population, so we're talking about potentially a call. Um, that an officer receives as opposed to a resource officer in a, in a high school, unless it's a K through 12. But you're talking about a really interesting space, which is, you're correct, it could be an on-call deputy getting a call, deputy state's attorney in the middle of the night from an officer about someone in this age range, and they have a discussion. Oh, yes, actually, that family is going through tremendous upheaval right now for this reason, and the, and the state's attorney is talking to that officer. Please do not prepare anything um, on this case. In fact, there's a pending, and this is, you know, a larger discussion, there's a pending, you know, chins proceeding happening um, with this matter, um, which, you know, complicates things certainly. But what you're talking about is a really interesting space that's hard to capture data because part of the space that you're in is that you're diverting, not even formally, you're actually diverting through this informal means and therefore there's a benefit to not having a paper trail because a paper trail later needs to be expunged, sealed, deleted, et cetera. So there's this interesting space that you're talking about. And I'm really happy you, you dwelled on it because it's an intangible that I often hear about from our folks out in the field and from law enforcement officers. Um, but the other thing I'll say is, you know, I had a case where there was a person that was in this age range um, involving a firearm, and we decided to do an extreme risk protection order kind of on the household, um, essentially, where the firearm was instead of filing a, a juvenile um, petition, because it really was this larger issue about access to firearms and not an issue with the individual child. Um, so I appreciate this presentation and um, wanted to paint some of the 
the picture that I've interacted with. Okay. Reverend Hughes. Thanks, Aton. Tyler, I'm wondering with uh, the data that we're looking at, it, it, it sounds like the assumption is largely being made that the youth who are uh, having juvenile cases filed against them, that the sole point of entry is law enforcement. Is Would it be correct to, to assume that uh, with uh, the Department of Children and Family being involved, say, for example, uh, truancy or... Uh, I don't know. I just it just I I don't know the process, but it, so my first question is 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 are there other points of injury? This I I want want to be clear. These are specifically referring to delinquency cases. So this would be a you know what what with a juvenile would be considered a criminal act. It's a delinquent act. Um, DC uh, DCF uh, works with these families, as Tim was just talking about, um, through a CHINS direction. Now, CHINS is different, like that's working through the child welfare perspective, and CHINS D would be a truancy case, CHINS C would be a beyond control of parent case. But the kind of differentiation there is we are working with um, the family uh, from a from that child welfare perspective, which is different from delinquency. It's, these are specifically delinquencies. Okay, so can, so just and sorry to you know hold everything up with the education here. So a chins would would not ever be referred to to juvenile. Well, it's the same court. Family court will see the same. So if you have abuse or neglect, a family court will see over that. But there's no age of minimum jurisdiction for that. You could have a newborn who is. Um, you know, within the realm of the family court for purposes of child welfare, right? If there's evidence of abuse or neglect or risk of, you know, that's a different that's a different avenue into child welfare. This is specifically talking about delinquency. Okay, thanks for that. My second question is 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 the RDAP, and this is like maybe a broader question, maybe not just for you, but the the uh, larger group is 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 the I'm um, I'm assuming that the RDAP is taking into consideration taking this into consideration in light of the fact that by raising the age from 10, maybe upwards 12, 13, something like that, perhaps it would um, reduce the disparities in the system. Uh, it sounds as though, um, based upon this conversation, that we're, we're not convinced that um, disparities are evident at this point uh, in, in the, with this data, but I wonder if that's kind of um, overly objective. I think what we're saying kind of on principle here is though these numbers are too small to say that there is evidence, statistical evidence that suggests this rate of disproportionality, these data do track along with what we know nationally about how um, how we work with, with youth of color compared to youth of uh, uh, white youth um, in terms of uh, what I said before about adultifying, are we looking at a behavior as as kids being rough with each other or kids being naughty or whatever, and they need a stern talking to, um, or are we looking at them as a criminal? Uh, I don't think we these data will tell us clearly, statistically, yes, this, no, that. But what we can say is raising to include this population um, would feels like it certainly would um uh ad address some of the what we see as disparity working with a, the uh, younger populations and rebecca i'm glad you've joined us here too because you're on this work group as well and i'm eager to hear your thoughts hi tyler hi everyone sorry to miss the introductions and come late i just showed up 10 minutes ago so i won't be the obnoxious one and ask questions when i haven't seen the presentation but I'm hoping, Tyler, can you share these slides uh, yeah. or some uh, now with the group so I can catch up? I haven't seen these numbers. I am on the subcommittee, but I haven't had a chance to preview this uh, presentation. And I might, I, I might need to. There's not that many slides. This is okay. really the first significant number slide we're looking at that you're looking at. The others have been mostly words. And it was the stuff we talked about, about generally speaking, is the RDAP comfortable with the idea of um, raising the age of minimum, juris, uh, minimum uh, jurisdiction? 
I would add then this this comment uh, to give some perspective. I hear I've heard you mention that these numbers are so small to be. I think I don't know what you said, but the takeaway is perhaps that we can't take anything too much to heart because these numbers are so small. I've heard that um, shared in different contexts with this group and in other places. But I, as I understand these numbers relating to whether or not there are racial disparities in our juvenile delinquency system, I understand that it is of significance that you look at the number of times this happens year after year after year after year, and that while any given drop down of a year may show small numbers, whether these are individuals or, or each individual cases or people, when you look at over time, and I, okay, thanks. That's the one I was wondering, Tyler, if you talked about. But in other contexts, not just looking at the 10 to 12, um, the what you are, I understand you sharing with the group, Tyler, that what we suspect is that racial disparities exist here too in Vermont juvenile delinquency system actually is, isn't, I think, a suspicion. I think it's been confirmed by the statistical likelihood that this could happen and should and be reflected year after year after year, even with these small numbers. Wow. But please correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I think I'm not an evaluator. I think I would probably want a, a researcher to answer that question. We have some researchers on the call they could get into that. Uh, and when I when I refer to statistical significance, though, I would say statistical significance is not the same thing as significance. You know, yeah. one life is significant. So if we're looking at a number of one, it is still significant to me. Um, if we're looking at it in terms of statistically significant, that's a that's a you know, that's a technical term. That's a scientific term um, that these numbers are, it's challenging when you have small numbers to have that finding. Uh, but if you look at it over years, I think we certainly can see trends. I think we can certainly see this. And I don't think anybody's really arguing that there is the capacity for uh, uh, disparity or injustice in these numbers. And what I guess I'm also saying is I'm fairly comfortable with the idea that we should be responding differently to 10 and 11 year olds um, than we would be responding to older youth or adults. It, it seems to me quite possible to make a um, case in the report that's very nuanced, that makes a distinction between something that is absolutely probative and something that is strongly suggestive based on other data. And then to, I'm just, I'm off the top of my head, folks, so it's not going to be real baked here, but um, something to the effect of that analysis, that kind of work needs to be done before this is bought wholesale or whatever you want to say. But something like that does seem possible to me rather than necessarily coming up with a firm and fast answer that solves everything. I mean, I think this conversation is set to happen in front of the legislature this yes. year, as, as my guess. And it, I think it would probably behoove um, the RDAP to have a stance on it if, sure. if we're able to get to that conclusion. Um, and that doesn't necessarily need to be grounded in, um, uh, you know, a detailed bit of science right. and research that's done, like what we know, right. what we believe to be true, what we know to be true generally, and the trends we're looking for, is this something we can get behind and support? Right. I'll move on. I only have a, a slide or two left. Uh, I want to draw everybody's attention to the unavailable slash blank column. These are cases where we didn't identify what the what the race of the the youth that was being arrested and and you know those are lower num they're none at ten, one at eleven, and then we jump up to eight. So while we see there were twenty white youth and zero black youth at the age of twelve. Um, there were eight youth that we did not identify what race they were. And it seems to me unlikely that those would be 
white youth. Um, but again, we can't, from the scientific perspective, make the assumption that these are black youth or Asian youth or Lat Latino youth. Um, but it raises the question of what do we do with that data gap? And I know this report isn't about data specifically, but that's a little bit of what we wanted to talk about also, um, is when we're talking about race and ethnicity data requirements, uh, the, you, you, I guess you can read, the, I'll, I'll kind of just read to you all. Um, but for years, more than 20% of the judiciary race and ethnicity data is in that category of unknown. That's a huge proportion of the people that are going in through the court system that are blank. Um, the judiciary gets this data um, through the law enforcement record, uh, that Form 101 I mentioned early. It's filed with the state's attorney. The state's attorney doesn't necessarily meet with this family prior to. I think what's on that or not on that is kind of what passes through up to the court level. And that I think I've just we discussed this a year or so ago about one of the limitations of the court data is there's this whole column of unknown. Um, and that's very problematic to us because it makes it um, really challenging to say how significant disparity would be because of this kind of ambiguous area. So the Council for Equitable Youth Justice um, looking into is can there be a requirement that that data is filled out? And that actually brings up the last questions for us about what is the best practice for gathering race, race and ethnicity data um, in incidents where youths are arrested. Um, and so the we've talked before about the conversation you have some youth uh, or some folks who are saying we need to know the race of the youth or the race of the person who is affected here. And that needs to come out of their report that comes from from them. Uh, there's another perspective on that is if we're looking to understand where racism is impacting the system, we need to be uh, understanding the perception of the law enforcement in this case um, member. Is it what's their perception of who they're uh, interacting with? And so and then the other question that comes up is where is it appropriate to be asking a person to divulge? Um, what, how they identify, do they identify as what race, uh, particularly during an engagement or experience that may be traumatizing or traumatic. Um, so when should we be asking that question? Um, and it, this it's a little bit of a you know general out there, where do we stand? What is the data we want? I mean, in some ways, ideally, we want it all. And before I get to your question, Witchy, I just wanted to share how how the child welfare side of DCF is um, kind of grappling with that question. Just this summer, we've changed our centralized intake um, approach, and this is the hotline. So when somebody gets involved with child welfare, it's very often that a mandated reporter or somebody else will call the, the hotline and say, I have concern about this family and, and, and explain what their concern is. And then we make a determination. Does this get screened out? Does this warrant an investigation? What do we do? How do we respond to that? And in that, we've made a concerted effort to say we are going to collect more race data at that point, because we want to understand not just who we're working with and how we can work with them better, but we also want to understand who is calling this in and why. And so the questions we have, and here we mentioned there's two data points. What is the perception of the person that we may end up working with? If we work with that family, we find out from their perception what their identified race is, but we're also gathering the data point of how does the mandated reporter identify the race of this family? And we'll ask specific questions about country of origin. There's more than that. And if you actually go, if you look up reporting um, in Vermont, reporting uh, the hotline in Vermont or whatever, child welfare reporting in Vermont, you'll see on that it lists out the questions that our workers will ask. And one of those questions is, what is the race of the reporter, um, which is beyond what, what I think is happening elsewhere. But really, that is to get at the question of where is the racism in our system? Where, like, what is baked in already? It's not just about understanding how do I culturally work with this one family with the most information I have. 
So that's uh, another question to kind of lob out the group. What is the interest of the group in terms of data collection uh, for for that? Okay. Um, which I, Judge Davenport, I wanted to make sure to honor the hand that Witchy had up, uh, unless you want to speak. Something uh, no, that, this is just um, this is just to add to what you've just said. What we know okay. about law, what what we understand about the law enforcement data, is that if the child, uh, the juvenile, um, is not taken to the police station. So they're just cited. They're, you know, the they have an interaction with the law enforcement officer and then they get a citation. Then what we're getting, if we're getting anything, then what we're getting is the law enforcement officer's perception of the race. But if it's a more serious offense and the youth is actually taken to the um, to the police station, then the then the youth is asked to self-identify what race they are. So to the degree we have any data on race, it's mixed. It's it's a mixed bag. It's it's perception. Um, if they didn't, if the if the youth didn't go to the police station, but if they did go to the police station, then it may be self-identification. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Witchy, did you still have a comment? Or yeah, question? can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. So one of the things that sort of, um, and, I've, and it's interesting, I've had this conversation with Aton recently um, for the Criminal Justice Committee, um, or I don't know how they're called, but um, talking about data that's being collected and the uh, what we're actually collecting, right? The the perception versus self identification. So I'm very happy that this is the conversation we're having, um, and acknowledging what it is that we're gathering. Um, I I further want to ask, you know, if there if the folks are asking race and ethnicity ethnicity data, one of the things that we need to make sure is that the people asking are trained on why are we asking it? How do you ask that? How do you coach someone, right? That, especially if you're a white person asking a person of color, like what's your race and ethnicity? And you're like, why do you want that info, right? So um, really thinking about how are we training our folks to ask for this information? Um, so people know that we're trying to eliminate disparities within race and not just asking just to ask. I just, let me point out here also that in this report, we're not going to get that far into the weeds with this, that when, you know, this is sort of suggestive as were the two reports that we did about that eventually resulted in the division um, it is suggestive of directions that the legislature ought to go in as far as we're concerned. Um, these questions around the details are the sorts of things that get worked out in testimony or when they come back to us, and I say this with a slight amount of humor, when they come back to us and go, gosh, we'd love a rather report this summer. Um, or something of that nature. So just bear that in mind here that um, we don't have to have this completely worked out to the nth degree. And if you remember what we went through doing that for the division, it took two years. We don't have two years <laughs> for this. So it this is going to be broad strokes, broad strokes. That's all. Just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you for for um, adjust, uh, clarifying that scope for us. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Yeah, I don't. I don't mean to like. St I. I get well. I don't mean to stop conversation, but I also need to, you know, get us focused on the task at hand as well. So that's all. I could, I could probably stop sharing at this point. I'm at the end of this um, and certainly would entertain any conversation. But I think the guidance we are looking for is would we like this framed in what we write up for the report as a recommendation from the RDAP to raise the age of minimum jurisdiction, to make a recommendation on how race um, um, data is gathered? Uh, you know, is, is what's the what what comes up for people out, out of this?
Rich Wishy, you first. I mean, I I would love for someone else to go first. Can someone okay. go first? Rebecca. Hi. I'm oh, sorry to um again be a little late to this part of the, the meeting. And um I wanted to hey, thanks, Tyler, for, for pulling the thoughts together and um of what our subcommittee talked about in terms of what I'm hearing you share tonight, which is our, our two primary areas. We could make Broad-based recommendations, Aton, your point noted just before, which is, do we agree that raising the age, um, and Tyler, I don't know if you presented here specific age from 10 to what? Well, I don't know. Um, yes. But based on the limited data that we do have, there is... Um, a trend of, of how this is connecting to racial disparities and disparate outcomes for youth of color. And that having the, raising the age of juvenile jurisdiction from 10 to 12, I think was or 13. I don't remember the age that we talked about. I think those details, I'm not sure we hammered out. Um, but the bottom line in terms of it is that the Defender General's Office certainly supported supported that. Uh, the frustration, as you could see from the numbers, I my frustration from seeing those numbers um, that Tyler presented is that how impactful is that recommendation overall in a system okay. where there are many more youth who are, are suffering from racial disparities, right? And disparate impact from the juvenile criminal justice system, right? right. Here, we were trying to drop in on the specific target. Um, and again, Tyler, I don't know if you talked about the justification for why the raise the age. You were talking about raise the age uh, of minimum jurisdiction, what I presented here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just generally speaking, I did speak to like, this is the trend. This is what we see nationally. This is how we interact with youth and young people in general. We had a conversation around what is intent when applied to a delinquent behavior. Um, and it's very hard to argue that an 11 year old is displaying intent with a certain type of crime um, when they're only 11 years old. And developmentally, it's it's unlikely that they would be able to have intent to do, you know, um uh, murder someone or intent to, you know, intent to what, whatever the charge type we're talking about. And in most cases, what these charges seem to be are like, um, like fighting, like kids fighting on the corner or something like that. And how are, how are we interacting with those kids, you know, public disorderly sort of stuff. And so again, the long and short of it is that this is low hanging fruit in terms of an easy recommendation to get behind because as, as Tyler said, we are, this is the rest of the, I don't know how many, but the majority, I think Tyler is this right, of the other jurisdictions out there are already there. I don't, I, I, I would no, say. No, I was wrong about that. I, actually, I shared a map as part of it and it found out about half the country doesn't have any minimum age of jurisdiction. I see. Um, I see. We're, we're in the top quarter of it, but we're not matched to like New York. We're not matched to New Hampshire, Massachusetts, other New England states um, are 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 at 12 um, or in the case of New Hampshire, 13. Um, OK, so thanks. Thanks for that clarification. Yep. So there, so there was that overall. And then in terms of if I can summarize the data component recommendation uh, again, without trying to present a proposal that's too much in the weeds, because we certainly don't want to <laughs> relive um, the experience we worked so hard on previously. But I think the overall theme on that is, A, I would hope we could get around a recommendation that underscores our further desire for the need for accurate data that reflects, reflects uh, whether there's Racial dis no, the extent of racial disparities in the systems and how to go about addressing it. I think the issue about perception, you know, consistency, right? How to enforce it and what kind of data to collect, self-identified or uh, perception. 
I would love if we can get some discussion and agreement on some of that. It's, I don't think that's too far in the weeds, but actually I, critical. I got all excited. I, I mean, Grant's not here. He's taking minutes from what Orca Media is going to put up. But ex I'm like, where I, I got all excited when you were talking, Rebecca, because I was like, oh, my God, this is it. This is it. This is what we need to be writing down. This is okay. exactly what we need to be writing down. Because you were capturing what we know, what we don't know, and that the need, and then also what we need to do, what correct action as we view it would be. And that's why I was all excited when you were talking, because you were like summing up, even though you weren't here the whole time, you were summing up basically the entire conversation for the last 45, 50 minutes. Witchy, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I really appreciate Rebecca going first. Uh, I, I think you covered basically um, a lot of my own insights. Uh, I personally would, would definitely vote for a recommendation with an and in it. I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about delinquent behavior and us as a society, how we, how we deal with it, um, I think it's in, it, important to note that if we... Uh, take away from the juvenile justice system, then we're putting more burden on our educators, on our caregivers, on our mental health systems, which are already strained. So I would want to make a note that, you know, as we, for the right reasons, uh, try to l raise the age, that we need to also make sure that resources are provided to transition and catch these folks who, or these kids that are having that are needing uh, care outside of the justice system. Um, and I just wanted to make a note, and Rebecca, I'm, I'm unsure on if, you, if you touched on, on this or not, um, my ADHD kicked in a little bit, um, but I want to note that there's, I don't think there's enough information to prove uh, that there are racial disparities. We can, um, and I think that's great, thank you. Tyler, do you feel from this discussion, you look a little, you look a little frazzled. Let me ask, okay. Um, do you feel that there's enough from this discussion that you can draft a paragraph that we can then attack and pull apart and put back together? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless, unless I'm hearing somebody with, um, kind of a distinct saying, no, this isn't a good idea. This right? like that I don't think right. we should take this path. Then I think we can kind of we we can put it and then we we'll pick it apart once I put it into writing. But yeah, I mean we're gonna make sure people whole... have the picture. Yeah. Sure. Sure. No, I mean we're gonna pick the whole thing apart. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um so I if you've got that, great. I could do that. We could do that. Elizabeth will help me. I'd like to hear from anyone else who's got something they feel that they that needs to be plugged in here. You've heard the discussion. You've heard the issues that Rebecca's raised. Witchy. Here we go again. Um, I just want to, um, and maybe that's not for this meeting, it's for the next, but want to get a clarification on what process we have for sharing, editing, reviewing, commenting. Um, um, yeah. Witchy, you always ask the questions that make me want to shoot myself. No, I'm kidding. Um, we have been using SharePoint, but as everyone knows, people like Singh have been having a horrible time with SharePoint. If Singh is having a hard time with SharePoint, there's just a problem with SharePoint. OK, that's just my feeling about Singh's abilities and that program. So we have been going back and forth and back and forth about putting these up on Google Docs. Um, there are issues because of procedure. Um, Aaron knows this far better than I do. Um, but that conversation, uh, well, no, that situation needs to be resolved and will be in short order. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? 
Sheila, are you good with what we've done so far? I'm interested in seeing what the mock-up's going to look like. You know, I okay. don't know which way I'm leaning or going. I think it's an interesting conversation. And like I said, I had those questions. And so yep. I, um, I'm just interested in the conversation that we'll have with each other. Okay. Okay. Then let's, let's get to the drafting. Let's get to the drafting because it's going to move us to another level of conversation. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and great. Thank you, Tyler. That was a lot of work. Appreciate it. You're welcome. It, it's a pleasure to do. I mean, because, you know, it's where it's where the needle, we have to find places we can move the needle. Right, right, exactly. Um, so, okay. Uh, next, we will, if, if no one has an objection, we move on to the second look subcommittee. And that would be our friend, Rebecca. Okay, hi. <laughs> and Aaron is here as well, who's on second look committee. And let me see if I see anyone else on that committee here as well. Um, Ray Dayton and Witchy, uh, I know that you have also joined. So I will, um, I see on the agenda, I'm to share an overview, an update. But do you want something a little more focused in terms of in the context of the report too, or? I would hope so, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, let me say this. We do not at this time, as a subcommittee, we have not yet landed on specific proposals to suggest to the panel as a whole. I think that's accurate to say as to what we should put in the report. So I'll put that out there right from the beginning. So it won't be like Tyler's presentation on, on, on the Juvenile uh, Justice Subcommittee. Uh, but here's the update, because we are not also just twiddling our thumbs. Um, the update is we have some materials before us comparing uh, various second look legislation that's passed around the country. Uh, again, second look laws are laws that uh, provide a statutory ability to revisit sentences imposed after certain uh, threshold criteria is met. There's um, laws in place that are passed by Congress. There are, there's um, DC uh, legislation that we're looking at we're looking, comparing to California's, Illinois, Louisiana. We are looking at model second look legislation that have, that's come out from um, the National uh, Station Criminal Defense Lawyers. And of course, we have the big anchor, which we're, we're seeing this in the context of, which is uh, Bill S-155, which was introduced um, last session, first biennium, and is uh, still there pending, and so could they'll continue to be uh, considered this coming session. And that is um, combined legislation, but for purposes of discussion, just the second look proposal there. Um, and so we are, as a subcommittee, sort of looking at these laws and proposed laws, model laws, to see what, what are the themes, where are there differences, what are the various approaches to the overall approach of the concept of revisiting a sentence imposed um, to see whether it warrants resentencing. And in that context, we are educating ourselves, but we are also planning a broader educational uh, project by way of a conference um, that actually VLS, VLGS, or the National Center for Restorative Justice, is that the name housed yeah. at, at VLGS, uh, are actually really sponsoring and paying for, providing the physical space for, providing all the logistics, everything needed to throw a conference uh, they're doing uh, with Jess Brown, our panel member on RDAP and also part of the subcommittee, and also I think her title is executive director at uh, 
the National Restorative Center and a professor at Veolia. She's been instrumental in making this conference happen uh, along with key players at VLGS, Bobby Sand, um, and oh, a couple other professors, I think that I'm forgetting their names. Uh, Aaron has been joining me on these twice a month meetings that are separate from our art app, Second Look, dedicated to conference planning. There, um, it's scheduled for November 3rd. I think a Save the Date card was shared by Jess yes. to all of the she panel sent members. It out. Last week, she sent it to all of us. Yeah, it's a three quarters day plan conference of Friday, November third at VLGS. Everyone here, I hope, um, can go uh, and to please spread the word. Uh, we are not inviting deliberately. The focus isn't to invite Vermont speakers. Uh, you know, I think the legislature will hear from, through testimony. Uh, from various sources in Vermont on whatever uh, is being proposed, right? And get those perspectives. What we wanted to bring in were sort of approaches, both from a, a data level, like why, 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 what is this? What, what is this concept of a second look? Why do we need why do we need it? What 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 are the goals that are are hoped to be achieved? And then so that's sort of a beginning panel. And then we wanted another panel that talked uh, from people who had ex are coming from jurisdictions that have experienced the rollout of it. How is it? How has it worked? Has it worked? Um, again, coming from uh, I think a pr practitioner's perspective. Um, what have been the wrinkles along the way? Uh, what have been the surprises? Been bad, and I think then the last set of speakers. Uh, that's planned are to get perspectives from people with lived experiences. Um, so people who have been victims of the incarcerative experience, right? Who have, and that's how sort of it's been discussed uh, and raised as, as from that perspective. Uh, from the perspective of people, families or people directly impacted and harmed by the underlying crime, right? Uh, those perspectives. Uh, and we are also hoping to bring in um, sort of a science-based uh, perspective on what is, what is the brain science on recidivism when someone's been sentenced to what type of offense, to what type of, to how the, you know, the length of sentence. Right. Uh, do the studies that show, you know, whether recidivism rates go up or down, um, bear out? And how does that inform second look? So that's sort of the conference planning, which is pretty exciting. I at least I'm excited for for this lineup um, of incredible sort of education around this uh, from others uh, out there. And, Rebecca. Uh, yep. Jennifer Pullman put a question in the um, chat. Oh. Will this also include victims of harm who were not supportive? Victims of harm who are not supportive? I'm not sure I understand what that is. Um, I can clarify. Um, I know that from DOC that there are 14 individuals who are sentenced to um, life without parole. And I work with those families. And I'm just wondering if there's been any conversation with those families. And I'm sorry, Rebecca, I'm off camera because I've been sick all day and I'm not a, a, I'm not camera worthy. But I'm just wondering what that conversation has looked like at the national level. I heard you say that there hasn't been anything at the local level, but I'm just trying to figure out what the panel is looking like. I think if I understand you right, I mean, I'll, I'll address, I'm sorry you're sick. Uh, whether or not, people have made an effort to talk with specific families impacted uh, with those life without parole cases in Vermont. Not no, like not in the context of this conference. Again, this is sort of a bigger picture look at specifically second, not, not whether or not second look laws should be passed period, right? It's looking at whether, um, in jurisdictions that have passed it, 
right? What has been the impact? That's, I guess, what uh, is broadly being approached here. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but in terms of the details of getting the specific voices of, of impacted here in Vermont, that's not the intent of this conference. That's 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 everyone is is recognizing that there will be that time opportunity in the legislature. So we're not. I think the goal of the conference is not to debate whether it's the details details of it. Again, I, I liked how Aton phrased it and got us got it redirected on the general justice discussion of of that sort of the place time and place in um, the committee level discussions if that bill is taken up. And it's more again trying to uh, get the benefit of, of both the practitioner's level, science level experts, and then people with lived experiences level of how has second look worked for them. And can I just add that in the conference planning, we've certainly talked about wanting to try to bring in voices um, from that perspective of um, it, second look laws that are victim centered. What does that mean? What what does that mean from the perspective of um, what we know about what victims experiences with the criminal legal system might be? And to that, you know, we are looking at, um, you know, ideas for various speakers, but the National Center on Restorative Justice is also thinking about this in terms of, uh, you know, bringing that restorative approach perspective, which is, um, you know, restorative approaches are very much um taking into consideration victims' voices and a victim-centered approach. So I I don't know who's going to be speaking precisely about what from that from that point of view, um, but it's not something that we are just setting aside or ignoring. And I didn't, I'm not saying that you were suggesting that, Rebecca. I just wanted to add the piece about the National Center helping us with this this aspect yeah. of it. No, thanks, Aaron. And and um I appreciate that. And 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 Jess, if she were here, she would have jumped in and, and shared that as well. Uh, so it's a, that's actually a very critical piece of, of this conference is getting the restorative justice perspective in, injected into this. Anyway, so that is sort of a three quarters day plan for this conference. Sort of remarkable. We're trying to trying to get people here with short notice. I don't know how many people we can get here in person uh, with no budget. Uh, short notice. Um, anyway, so we're gonna have uh, uh, possibly remoting in speakers. Uh, there's lots of questions. I think Jess, someone share asked whether or not anyone had thoughts on live streaming the conference as well, as opposed to just planning to record it and have it in person. And I'll actually I'll pause here if if anyone wants to share thoughts on that question it would be greatly appreciated to hear thoughts on this because this is uh, being debated right now in the conference planning team Richie, thanks i think um i'm a staple of my generation i always prefer things re remote because i can do it like you know in my pajamas and ask questions also and be involved in the conversation um that that would be my personal preference. Live streamed remote. Got it. Thanks. That was our instinct. Um, Richie, did you have something else? Oh no, sorry. Legacy hand. Oh, uh, eight on your oh no, <laughs> legacy hand. Um. All right. So I, I I'll take that and I'll share that. If anyone else wants to share, that. oh Sheila. Yeah, I just, um, I'm not of that generation and <laughs> love you, witchy. And, um, <laughs> and you know, it's a yes and, right? 
like of course there are benefits to being able to have it live stream online and when you are having a conference um well any conference but specifically a conference with these type of um um topics that we're going to be engaging in i think it would be I, I like vibe checks. I like body language. I like understanding people. I like me, like there's some essence to it. So I don't know if people want to do a hybrid and, and see if that's a, if that's an option, but I do think, um, having something in person, um, there's some value to that, especially with these, um, type of topics that we're discussing. Okay. I'm going to be the wet blanket. Um, Rebecca, Yes. Are we ba are you basically saying that the subcommittee doesn't want to propose any bullet points or you know rough paragraphs until after the conference? Uh, uh, yes and no. So here's 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 the thing. We we meet monthly, but not until after our monthly Tuesday. We meet on Thursdays, <laughs> and I'm hoping on uh, this Thursday that I can bring the subcommittee together on sort of these broad category outline points. And if I could just share, like the things sure. that we've been comparing the different laws and model laws and proposed laws on, right? What are the threshold requirements for eligibility? One, what are okay. the what are the crimes or underlying circumstances that make one ineligible or eligible? Is this legislation specifically targeting youth only, or is it more expansive, right? Okay. Uh, is the petition process one where there is um, automatic notification of, of qualification, or does someone just have to be in the know and stumble upon it and affirmatively apply, right? So how much is this sort of encouraging review on, on, a, on a predictable automatic okay. level. What factors does a judge consider? What evidence does a judge consider? How much discretion do we want to give a judge to consider any number of factors? Do we want to actually identify specific factors? These laws vary on that. No law that's been passed has an identified factor that you must consider race, ethnicity uh, of the applicant before you, right? So there's nothing like that or anything actually specifically expressly identifying race. So that's something that our subcommittee noted early on. We have not discussed where we have fallen on it. Another category, who decides? Who decides the petition of review? Is it the original sentencing judge or is it important to have a new judge, a different perspective, right? Okay. What is the retroactivity of these laws? Do these, if this law passes, does it come into effect from here on out? Meaning that everyone else who's sitting in jails right now serving a sentence automatically not qualified for this right. set of laws, right? So right. what is what are the what is what are these principles that that, that encompasses, right? Do we want to go there? Um, if the petition is successful in terms of identifying evidence, eligibility, all this stuff, you're you mean it. What should be the reduction? Is there a minimum reduction that the judge has to consider in, in doing the sentence? Right to counsel, is there right to counsel involved? Uh, is there victim involvement? I know there's been a lot of interest in, in, in whether or not and how and to what extent, okay. you know? Uh, and then I think that's it. I think appeal to appeal process, whether there's an appellate review. So- I want, yeah. Let me just put it here. Yeah. Um, there's this wonderful sort of moment when you're teaching graduate students who are about to write the dissertation where they've got all these thoughts and they are an endless fount of thought. And there's always like, oh my God, and I didn't think about, and I didn't think about, and at a certain point you look at them and you're like, okay, you have a couple options here. You can write a 600 page dissertation. And for those of you who don't know, um, that's crazy. Just, I'm just letting you know that now. Um, and you kind of have to sort of go, all right, there's gotta be a cutoff point at which you just say no more. Um, 
I realize, and I'm saying this as warmly as I can, we've got to do that with some issues that have really, really, sometimes horrifying impacts on the lives of li living beings. So I say that with that full knowledge. On the other hand, if we don't put boundaries around these conversations and come to a point of going, this is what we're suggesting. And maybe if it's amorphous, we come to a position where we're saying, these questions are essential to any decision made about X, and then give a list of questions, that sort of thing. And I'm trying to get us all to think about that because the thought here I could sit and listen to you all all night without any problem. I mean, I really could. It, but we can't. We can't. Um, I am sitting in. I have to testify to joint judicial oversight on the twenty sixth of this month. Um, I think at nine in the morning. For anyone who cares, they just sort of want to know what we're up to. Um, the other thing that we're up to, and they they kind of know this, is um, I'm also going to say, hi, everyone got flooded out of their office. We get an extension, right? Thank you. Love you. Mean it. Bye. And that's kind of a big part of it. But that still is going to take us probably to the end of January. Um, when I was asked, how long do you want? I said, how long can you give me? which wasn't quite what was wanted, but I did my best with that. Um, I just want to put that out there that all the utterances we're making now, we've got to somehow round into a written document so that when we've got a list of questions, like the ones that you just so wonderfully put in front of us, Rebecca, that maybe, I mean, my one suggestion was that. That just came off the top of my head. I'm sure there are others I could come up with. But that sort of thing is where we have to start going with this. Because you need to remember here, not only do we have to edit this after we've get it, got it written down to some form, we then have to take it back to the proxies. And if you all remember, that's a real joy. It takes, <laughs> you'll all remember that, right? Please smile and tell me you remember what that process is like, where you're going to them and you're like, I really need the document. And they're like, oh yeah, we know we're gonna have it for you tomorrow. Four days later, hi, remember that document? Oh, I know, we'll have it for you tomorrow. And then five days after that. So we've got to build in all of that. And I have to keep that in mind for us that that's all got to happen here in amongst all of this really, really wonderful conversation and thought. And the most I can say to you is, believe me, there'll be more conversation and thought down the line. <laughs> but I just, I need to just put that out there. I have to start sounding a little bit like Professor Ness Redden Longo at this point. Hey, John, and can I Sorry, can Go I ahead. respond with a, with a proposal, listening and hearing what you're saying? On on Thursday, our subcommittee is meeting again, and I think that we can land and identify sort of these broader these questions, these categories that I just shared with you in terms of what we've identified as a significant sort of points um, of sure. what makes each of these laws different or not. I, I think that the proposal of the subcommittee will to drop down and be like, well, no, knowing this, not that they're set in stone, but what can we agree are the most important mm -hmm. things for us? Mm -hmm. And whether right. it's, you know, and again, not get bogged down in the details because we won't get out of the subcommittee enough to even talk about a group. I think then hopefully if we can at least land on some common ground that mm -hmm. I can then share, summarize something similar um, to what happened in the juvenile justice committee where we, we got together and summarized, got together. And I can share that with that subcommittee. Great. Then we are having this conference on November 3rd, ahead of our next big panel meeting. 
And then, and then you can add to the agenda for next month for their big panel that will come together with sort of these proposed principles. Perhaps we wouldn't have had the advantage, I think, with the timing of November 3rd in our next meeting to have met as a subcommittee. So that might be something where we then present it. And then for those of us who are able to make, go to the conference right. and, and, and those who haven't, a brief summary of the hot points. Right. And, and whether and what okay. we want to integrate. So I think we can do it is my okay. point. I think it's on. No, I'm sorry. I, I again, please don't all hate me. I just that's my job. I've got to I've got to do this. I've got to say this. I've got to give us some form here and some direction. And um, it's not the pl most pleasant thing to do, I can tell you, because I'd rather just listen to the thought myself. But we have a job. <laughs> so. Anyway, sorry. Thank you, Rebecca. That sounds like a wonderful um, plan, basically, for getting stuff out in that direction. And I think that that'll work really well. Sheila, you've got your hand up. Thanks, Aton. Thanks, Rebecca. Of course. I am. Um, I really like this idea, and I like the idea of when you were reading off all those questions, it's sort of, I feel like it's like my, how my brain works. <laughs> like I always think of them, that does this, 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 this. And as a person who's done some consulting, a lot of times in the consulting world, you, people don't know what they don't know. And so you have to engage them in a way of um, even preparing people to ask the appropriate questions in order to get the information, the data, whatever we're looking for. And so I really like being able to throw out whatever it's from the subcommittees or otherwise of what are the topics that RDAP is really, um, really interested in putting in this report. And then having that narrative of those, of those questions, because I think that is a start of a foundation to where people can go from, because if you've never thought of that, then how are you supposed to proceed on that or, or look at things a different way? And so I think it's really important to be shifting questions by putting um, those type of questions in there that maybe um, we haven't thought about before. And something that you said, Rebecca, um, that I am very interested in moving forward in is around, um, you know, we don't have, I guess, I don't know if it's a law around asking around race, um, you said and at getting that information. And I'm just, I'm, it's it's very interesting. And so I, I would like to talk um, specifically more with the RDAP about that being one of our initiatives. Okay. Jennifer Pullman has put forth in the chat again, um, is there a rope in or back to the sentencing commission at some point? I can't answer that. Um, not really being on the sentencing commission. So, I, I raised that, that Aton, because Rebecca's on Rebecca's the vice chair, and there used to be a subcommittee. And I feel like there's been a lot of work that's been happening here, and I'm just wondering if there's any thought about connecting back to the sentencing commission. It's a good idea, uh, Jen. We can uh, talk to Judge Zone. We're, we're next meeting on sentencing commission on other things on October. I think the twenty fourth. Um, the agenda's out there. But in terms of whether or not we have the time to both share this with Sentencing Commission and get a vote from there and try to work out some consensus or agreement before our report is due in RDAP, I, I see that as sort of a step, not a not appropriate. I, mean, I think they're two different animals. But in terms of- I, I agree. I wasn't suggesting it would be Right. inappropriate okay. appropriate, yeah, but okay. it, like the conversation has really taken a significant turn he, uh, really getting gotten into a lot of detail and a number of the questions that you mentioned that were raised i know were raised by evan meenan um on the senate commission so it feels like at least a hello we've been working on this would be would make some sense certainly that it's not going to be something that could be voted on but i do feel like it would be helpful rebecca in your position to report back at some point. No, that's a that's a great idea. Uh, and for others who may or may not recall, Senate the Commission, which does not have any community members, um, had a subcommittee created on second look mm -hmm. and with many of overlapping members with RDAF and Sex Sentencing Commission. That's why Jen Pullman has joined us 
uh, for uh, it has been invited to to be part of the to the sec second look subcommittee uh, meetings um, because the sentencing commission agreed and knew about RDAPs. Um, mm -hmm. Efforts on this regard didn't uh, want, I think, it, for efficiency's sake, for a lot of reasons' sake, I guess, it was a decision made at that level to to sort of defer and let the work be done here at the RDA. Okay. So, but Jen, good point, bring it up at sentencing commission. Cool. All right, um, Witchy, you're not on the agenda, but you sent us a lovely document that got me all excited when it came in about half an hour before the meeting, where you outlined exactly what your subcommittee is doing in terms of writing between now and November. Can you summarize that for everyone? Because I'm not sure everyone had opportunity to read it. Uh, no, no one has had an opportunity to read it except you, Ethan, because you're so on top. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, so like, this is just me gathering a bunch of thoughts from our subcommittee and what we've talked about and what we saw in the interviews, what we read about and our notes on it. Um, and Sheila, it's, it's in your email. I don't know if you're checking your email while you're technically on vacation, but it's, it's there. Oh, I've got it. I'm in it. Oh, great. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just talking about, um, I think three things that were kind of, well, two things that were, I think were pretty common across the reports. Um, and one thing that got mentioned in the interviews by both folks, um, the two things that were really in common is just talking about the effectiveness of policing, uh, like why police, what we police, and uh, the impacts of it in our communities, and uh, maybe some recommendations uh, from these reports on, on what we can do about it. The other one was the effectiveness of training. Um, it's, there was a lot of conversation about not only what's in the training, but who like who needs to be the per like um who is the person who goes to training uh, kind of like there was a lot of talk about you know you have to be, have the willingness to learn right you have to like have con con historical context of who you are entering uh, and what you're entering into um and the final thing that was not necessarily in the reports except the Burlington one but got mentioned at the interview um several times to the citizen review board and just thinking about what does that actually look like if we're if that's going to be a recommendation that comes out um and what it should it should it look like what does authority look like what are the pros and cons of citizen review boards that um, have happened in vermont and that's sort of um in, in and there's a section for paths for exploration which is just like other things that got mentioned that we just didn't have time to go deeper in uh, so th that's just sort of a general synopsis of all the things, Sheila. I don't know if you want to subtract, add, overrule, sustain. <laughs> no, everything's great. Thank you, Witchy. Can I ask a question of you guys? Are you, is there going to be a moment? I, I had this idea when you sent it to me. Is there going to be a moment in there where you make a suggestion on, on, to the legislature that these reports not only be encouraged, but also at least partially funded by the state? Is that, I, I'm just curious where that's gonna go in terms of recommendations to the legislature. We would like you to fill well, in the blank. So the way I, the way I see that is, <clears throat> this is, was presented to y'all at the last meeting. Mm -hmm. Then there's this report that, um, which he has out prepared to put together. Then everybody else on this panel helps chime in and ask questions like that to see if we as a group want to do that because it's a we situation anyway. Right. So I would say that if that's what sparks from this, then let's make that a discussion of this group and see if that's the direction we want to go in. Is okay. Because Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that'll be on the agenda, I guess, for next month. Is that all right? Sounds perfect. Got it. Good. Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, my God, where'd the time go? Um, I don't know. In any event, uh, new business. 
I'm not sure we have any, but if anyone's got some, fling it out there. <laughs> Yes. This isn't new business per se. It's just a general community announcement. The Grand. state of Vermont is, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know why I also ate a candy right before this. So, you know, um, the state of Vermont is um, hosting a series of community forums related to mm -hmm. traffic statute enforcement and um <clears throat> it is a joint venture between the department of motor vehicles the department of public safety and the office of racial equity um it is a compressed timeline i apologize for the late notice the next forum will be taking place in st john's Barry tomorrow from 6 to 8 p.m it will also be hybrid there's a zoom link and for those who can't attend virtual or in person, there's also an online feedback form so that people can provide their feedback without having to attend a session. We'll be feeding people who attend in person. And um, if you're interested, I can provide details in the chat. This is the second of five. We're trying to hit every region of the state. We've already done the Northwest region. We are now doing Northeast region. So the remainder are Central, Southwest and Southeast. Those are going to take place over the next two weeks. No. All right. Anything else? Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? All right. I want all of you who are feeling. Oh, hold on. Go ahead. Can I, even though everyone just wants to leave now, um, I, I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm obviously not a member of the panel, but I'm just compelled to thank you all. I mean, I've been to now three of these meetings and just listening to the immense amount of work that's being done. Um, I just really appreciate it as, um, as a legislator and understanding how much is going to go into how much goes into preparing these reports and um, how much thought and time and energy and research. And um, I, I'll just say as one legislator, one member of the Judiciary Committee, which will be looking at all of this when it's come, when it comes together, I really, really appreciate it. And I just thank you. It really thank informs you. our work in a way that we, don't, we can't do without folks, you know, like you partnering with us. So, just want to appreciate all of you. Thank you, Representative. Mark. Hey. Wow, I made it. So I wanted to um, <laughs> just thank y'all um, for the work too, um, with like Rep Arsenal was saying. Other thing too was is that um, like that the conversation that you and I had, um, Aton, I think it's yes. Act, Act 65, Yes. Um, you know, I think it was Pepper actually and I who were speaking on Friday that prompted right. me to to be reminded of that. And I, I know you guys have probably spoken about it um well, before, but it's a section twenty four A. Okay. Were you were you getting ready to say something? Go, go ahead. Well, I wanted to let you know and let the other people know what I'd like to do is when we're done meeting, mm -hmm. when we adjourn. I'd like you, Mark, me, yeah. Susanna, Tiffany, and Laura to stay on for a few minutes. And Mark, I'd like you to address us about where you'd like us to go on that particular front. That's cool. And, and briefly, just for the the rest of the um, yes panel, thank you. It, it's it's just the um, if if you were to look at, I can just drop it in the chat. The twenty four. 24A is uh, the the panel. It's about equity and the community reinvestment fund, the cannabis fund. And the, you know, the short background on it is is that when the marijuana commission went out and did their work, there was no there was nothing that they brought back on equity. So even at this juncture, a, a year in, um, the the whole the the work that they've been doing surrounding F equity is is kind of being questioned specifically by probably more Ann Cummings than anybody else. 
so finally we just said fine if if you need to if you need some data then maybe what we should do is just have somebody go and get you some data if that's what you if if that's what you need so um that's the long and short of it is it's really um just that simple the other thing that i was going to uh say is is uh aaron if if uh if we can get an opportunity i was hoping that we could circle around with the um with uh um i think it's big now who's over at the uh human human rights Co uh, commission i want to revisit the racial disparities in all systems uh and i, I want to maybe sit down with you and big and in Tsutsana, perhaps at some point, uh, because I think there's major implications there that we should probably at least revisit. Uh, I'm glad I would be, you brought, sorry. I'd be happy to do that, Mark. I would say another group I would love to convene with is the Tr Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's part of their charge is to remedy past harms. I think we mm -hmm. could you know, that could be a really important part of the conversation and in general for the work of the RDAP. But however, however you want to organize these convenings, I'm happy to be there. Yeah, I think we want to do something in the community on it as well. And that's all I had, Aton. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'll stick around. Um, but also, there's what I just wanted to point out the one thing I, I managed to leave this out. You'll remember a while ago, I did a sort of breakdown of what got done from the 2019 report and what didn't. It was a really fun meeting. Everybody was in a really good mood afterward. Um, I, have, I had written an email to everyone saying, I will write that up as something to consider con uh, including in the report. I've somehow managed to miss this whole meeting and not say yeah. to you, I'm on it. <laughs> I am on it. I am writing it up as we speak. Well, not like right now, but you know, um, I am on that. It will come. Um, I will take that on. Witchy. And then we're gonna we're gonna shut down soon, folks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just just wanted to make a general note, uh, especially you know, Mark, as you were talking about. Um, the sort of racial disparities in all systems. Um, for those of you who don't know, in a week and a half, I will be the new NAACP of Wyndham County president um, and definitely uh, would love to be part of those conversations and or um, have a representative uh, be able to join in on those conversations as a rep from the Southeast as possible. Okay. All right. Um, yes, congratulations, Witchy. Or President R2. Um, oh, I like that. Uh, okay, our next meeting, 14th of November, 2023. Um, I imagine there'll be a fair amount of email that will go back and forth. Um, and that's, I think, what we have. Can we have a motion, perhaps, to all go eat dinner? I move we all go eat dinner. Anybody <laughs> all else also feel the same way? Oh, somebody else feels <laughs> that way. Everybody ready to go eat dinner? I uh, yes. will do it. Everybody who doesn't want to go eat dinner? Everybody abstaining because they really don't know whether they want to eat dinner or not. Well, I already ate dinner, so. You know, well, you're you not told so. some of us that we have to stay. That's right. I did say that. You're right, Mark. I'm sorry. God forbid. All right. Mark, Susanna, and the um, Laura and Tiffany, if you could just hang on for a few minutes. <laughs> Mark's asking, what are you on? God only Thank knows. Everybody. Um, uh, can you, can you, otherwise, be, all of you, talk to you soon. Thank you, Aton. Have a good one. Good Thank all. you. I have to um, keep this meeting going since I'm the host, but I'm oh. just not, I'm going to mute myself, turn off my video, and I'm not going to eavesdrop. There's, just there's so nothing you wrong know. with you being around, Aaron. I, there, anybody could have stayed on the call. It's not, sure. it's not secret. I'm glad, I'm always no. glad to have you in the room. <laughs> well, it's really I do want to go secret. eat my dinner. Okay. <laughs> and ah, so, so thank you for the, the invitation. <laughs> and goodbye. I'll see you later, Aaron. <laughs> okay. okay. Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks. It'll be really brief. I dropped the I dropped the um 
the document in there is section 24A and in, in the vast majority of the thing is like a is a strike all. So the the policy is a heck of a lot smaller than it seems. It's certainly not that, you know, I think I'm on the 62nd page right now, which is nonsense. Um, and it's really simple. If you just get down there uh, to the, the 61st page, it just, uh, and I'm just going to really insult you and read it to you. It says, this is the racial disparities in the criminal juvenile justice system advisory panel shall collaborate with local and national stakeholders to study the, the administration and funding of the Cannabis Business Development Fund and gather qualitative and quantitative data informing the establishment and funding of community reinvestment for individuals and communities disproportionately impacted by the criminal criminalization of, of cannabis. And the study shall do each of the following. Identify in an aggregated format the demographics of individuals who have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition in Vermont and nationally and identify communities most heavily impact it while not disclosing the identity of any particular individual and to identify the ways in which such individuals and communities have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition in Vermont, including rates uh, of poverty, rates uh, access to employment, housing and education and involvement with the criminal justice system. Uh, any other issues related to the impacts of the criminalization of cannabis in Vermont and the United States that will improve racial equity and community reinvestment in Vermont. The panel shall convene not less than four times to complete its work. And then finally, the panel will provide recommendations on how to administer and fund the Cannabis Business Development Fund and fund and administer reinvestment in individuals uh, and communities disproportionately harmed by cannabis criminalization to the Senate Committee on Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs and Finance on or before the 15th of January, and that's in 2014. Uh, Sutsana is you are, I know, intimately familiar uh, with um, most of, you know, I don't want to overstate it, but I'm in obvious, I'm, I can, I think I'm, I'm pretty confident that you're very, you've seen, you've watched this play out um, as far as how the, um, the idea of equity uh, was pursued in the, uh, Tiffany and Laura, it's really good to meet you both. And I think I'm going to put my camera on now because I feel really awkward right now. So, um, <clears throat> hi, um, so I can't see myself, but, um, wait, there we go. There we go. So, um, the, let me see if I could just give you brief background. So, cause I know everybody's hungry is, is that, um, in 2018, the governor called for a, um, a, what we call a marijuana commission and you will find all of that on file, on legislative file. Um, there were several reports that came out of it, none on equity. Um, so given the gravity of the um, the implications of legalizing a Schedule One federal drug in the, um, the relate, you know, and obviously given the, the war on drugs and what we understand, uh, you know, that has created nationally and also um, just the um, sy systemic racism, obviously being rooted in political and economic, um, the the whole um, uh, political and economic divide along racial lines. I, you know, I had some concerns right out of the gate. You know, as the market began to emerge, um, and uh, we've have been we have been trying for the last two years, three years, to somehow or another attach some component of equity uh, to the rollout of the market, and. There have been some uh, efforts to do so. In fact, the, the entire market was um, was premised on equity. It, uh, Pepper was on earlier today. He he's the um, he's the he's the CCB uh, chair. Um, the 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 thing is is that they they just um, it's just been an awkward exercise, and I think part of it uh, has been um, you know uh, the the whole idea about definitions and. And who is impacted? And there's been this conversation about the fact that, oh well, how do we, you know, how do we, you know, prove that, you know, this group of people are impacted? One of the things that we were looking to do was not just um, provide some kind of um, a hand up for a person uh, as far as you know, 
uh, you know, I would say I'm um, finding a um, uh, an avenue into the to the market or the you know a mm -hmm. career, but also how do we um, address communities as well? Like you know, impact if if there are communities across the state that have been impacted, how do we reinvest in those communities? And also, um, you know, how do we you know mm -hmm. create a f a fund that's first of all sufficient, secondly uh, sustainable. Uh, sustainable. Um, and I don't think the fund to date has been either one of those. In fact, the the um, the administration of the fund has been somewhat of a train wreck. And I think that um, Pepper would be the first one to tell you. In fact, I would think that he would be the first one that, if I were you, I would I would um, consult or interview. Uh, finally, I'll just uh, say that um, currently, right now, there you know because of the strong emphasis from the administration on safety. Uh, and um, and prevention, there there's been a significant portion of the excise taxes that have already been set aside. Um, you know, now given the uh, the balance of the the fund last year, they didn't quite know how to administer, it, and it wasn't really. Pepper would agree it was it was really not administered well. The money that they did have, and they just kind of at the end of the day just cut a you know, a bunch of $5,000 checks and just sent them out to, um, to many of the folks who applied, uh, as, um, as, um, I guess you say, impact. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, we were kind of along the way for a lot of this, I guess my question is what is the, what's the baseline question on the table right now? There's no baseline question on the table right now. I, th I think that, um, you know, just, before I, I do respond to that, though, I, I will just state that um, what it sounds like is, is that there are, there's probably upwards of about $10 million that they really don't know uh, where, how it's going to be administered. And they're, they're getting ready to go back into another calendar year, not understanding uh, what they're going to do with the, um, the, the budget, you know, that, that which is budgeted. So I don't really have a question. The reason why I'm here is, is, <laughs> is just to raise this to your attention this commit this uh this panel's attention because with it you know I'm I'm one of the co-founders of the cannabis equity coalition along with nofa and, and rural and growers and and some of the other folks and we were in a meeting on Friday uh with uh pepper some of us were and this uh this topic came up and he was uncertain as to uh, if and when and how uh, this uh, body would be responding to it. And what I wanted to do is just come and give you a little bit of background, if you will, and also um, just to make sure that you guys are off to the races on it. Um, yeah. There's there's nothing else that I have to add to the conversation and there are no questions that I have. Mm -hmm. This is really just informational uh, and just to make sure that you had what you needed to get started on it mm -hmm. is all. Do you have okay. any questions of me? I do. Okay. So do you go ahead? Go ahead, Susanna. No, I I was gonna say I I don't really um we have regular check ins with the CCB mm -hmm. um every couple of weeks and a lot of the the issues that you're raising we had um had yes. those conversations with them um and kind of had to figure out how to navigate some of the the how to navigate the the challenges of it. Um, I think a lot of the decisions that that the decision points that you're talking about, we probably agree that we're dissatisfied with the outcome too, for probably the same reasons. Um, and and I can also say that there were some of those decision points were ways to avoid a worse outcome. A lot of it felt like, a lot of it felt like a zugzwang, you know. Every every move is a bad. Like a move. What? It's a German word I learned. <laughs> that every <laughs> move is a bad move, right? Oh and yeah, so it's, it's true. I yeah. think, so so the short answer is I I don't have questions right now. I do agree that the fund can be seen as. the year that it was passed 
Um, if you're not careful with how you, whether and how you maintain something like that, then it becomes a bright, shiny object that loses its luster once the headlines fade. And then the equity is not really a commitment. It's just a talking point in the moment. So um, that's definitely not what we want. And I think if the purse string holders and policymakers claim that that's not what they want, then it's really clear that we have to do something to fix it this year. Um, so we've been having some of those conversations. It's led to bigger conversations about who manages money and why and where equity work should be cited in state government. And mm -hmm. that gets complex real fast. So, and I'm sorry for being so cryptic about everything. I'm just recognizing that we are still on with, with press and I want to be careful about um, how I represent mm -hmm. another agency's business. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your response. And I, I think that, um, you know, it's just from my analysis and I don't, I don't have to be as, as careful with the press. Um, but from my analysis, what it feels like, what it looks like is, is that um, over the last couple of years, we've been working to address the harm that has been done uh, by the legacy of slavery. And the um, that is, you know, to the point that I was making earlier on the call where the Attorney General and the Human Rights Commission as a part of the enabling statute that stood up this body um, created a report and acknowledged that there are racial disparities across all systems of state government. And wherein um, two years ago, the, the entire legislature and joint, legis and joint resolution in their declaration made a commitment to address systemic racism, wherein as the following year after this body was stood up that your position was created as well, uh, with the first position that was created in state government that acknowledged that systemic racism was an issue. Um, part of your charge, as you know. Um, it, to me, it's it's um, somewhat troubling that we can have so much, there could be so much to do about systemic racism, but at the same time that it cannot be acknowledged when we start talking about money that largely that there is a political and economic divide along racial lines. And when we stand up something, especially something that represents um, what we're talking about now, and that is, is you know, what we've used to criminalize, what we use to weaponize uh, and to um, and also deprive uh, black and brown folks for years of their liberties, as well as their economic uh, advantages, uh, that we would be still sitting in committee saying, well, prove to me that this affected uh, black folks in this way or that way or communities in this way or black and brown folks. So it is somewhat troubling. Um, just as, you know, just like it's troubling to sit around and listen to conversations about folks saying, well, you know, in the juvenile justice system, I don't quite see the numbers where, you know, it could be that there are racial disparities in these numbers. Um, you know, the book that I read is, says that where systemic racism exists anywhere, it exists everywhere. Um, and I just don't know that we've kind of figured that out yet. I'm glad we've got folks on there, the, you know, to, to look at the numbers. And that's great, but I think um, you know some. I think we're going to have to get past the quantitative analysis and move towards the qualitative analysis and get and move past our objectivity and and become subjective in some of the the work that we're doing here. But I'm glad you guys are looking at it, and um, you know, I, you know, it is frustrating though to you know to um, sometimes to uh, to hear. Um, some of this stuff, you know, in committee, especially from folks like, um, like, um, you know, the, the senator um, who's who's saying, "Well, I don't, I don't see, I don't see the data." Um, so, so yeah, hopefully you you guys can take take a, you know, take a run at that, and and maybe I don't know, Suzanne. I think, do you think that, you know, what is presented to them would be. Would it be wise for us to also, and I, I ran this by Pepper, would it be would it be wise for them to, to to conduct an analysis on some data points on what the cannabis taxation and 
deregulated program has produced um, year to date. I mean, I know that it has, it's been up and running for a year. For example, the attrition rate of, of, of some of these uh, minority owned businesses are, is horrendous. Um, would it be helpful um, in that data collection to uh, analyze the, um, what the, what the, um, what the market is, is produced to date as well? Yeah, and I don't even know if that has to be CCB or if that can just be tax department giving those numbers or or joint fiscal because they have they have that um, pretty yeah, square. I mean, numbers though. I mean, I mean, I would imagine there would be a few data points. Some would be the the tax department. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of these data I imagine would be really helpful. Um, at, at the end of the day, I mean, this is about people committing to investing tangibly in. In, in what they claim to value and in inequity. So I don't think that um, it, it's not complicated. Um, no, it's a matter sure. of will. We have uh, a lot of proposals on the table um, that came up from legislators and other people um, when this whole thing was first being uh, proposed. The question about whether it's investing in communities or in the businesses themselves or in the people themselves, the question about, well, can we just put it to the state college system and give people vouchers to the college? How does that really help, for example, the Black single mom who's 55, who's already done with schooling and doesn't intend to go back, but has still been negatively impacted by uh, enforcement? So, I mean, How did that I came think up? that um, it's about wrangling all of the potentially good ideas that people have and keeping it really focused so that we determine A, are we really trying to repair harm to communities? B, do those communities have to have been harmed by enforcement in Vermont or just in the United States or in the world in general? Um, and because I think that hits at a philosophical question that a lot of people ask, which is what do we owe to people who this state didn't directly cause harm to, even though you know you can always draw a line. Um yeah. and then the question about what are we going to do about it and what's going to be actually really meaningful for people. Personally, I don't think that vouchers to universities and, and other educational institutions is what's going to be meaningful because I think that it pigeonholes people into one pathway that's proving increasingly not worth the effort and money in America. Um, not to mention, it's just not a good fit for everybody. A lot of people have already pursued higher ed in, in their own ways, and it may just not be the right timing for them. Um, right. Again, investing in communities is hard because you have the geographic communities and then you have the demographic communities, right? You could throw a lot of money into Burlington because that's where a lot of brown people live, but you're not really getting it people of color statewide. You're just taking the easy way out by going for highest concentration. And that's not really moving the needle. Or we could look for the demographic distribution, but that's a little bit harder because you're distributing it across the more rural areas. And then it's hard to really see measurable impact when it feels a little bit disparate. Um, then you have, you know, big name people who are trying to get in as well and like claiming, oh, we're doing this and we're donating 10% of whatever to black out of retailers or whatever and it's just, you know measuring what is really the impact of that um is it helpful do, does the state need pu public private partnerships i think that these are a lot of free floating questions and um and then yeah, once you figure good. out what you want to do how you want to fund it whether you want to fund it how much then you got to figure out which agencies are going to be responsible right now they've got uh, accd handle holding the money and that for that reason um a lot of how it gets spent and when it gets dispersed and all of that process is largely dictated by ACCD. Um, they tend to be subject matter experts on doing that kind of thing. They are not subject matter experts on race, equity, criminal justice, or cannabis. So, you know, there's 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 a lot of questions about how the process should go. And those questions are definitely leading to some pain points and frustrations um, behind the scenes. And I just think that... Um, the board, I think, has been very cautious in how much it pushes and lobbies in the legislature. Um, Rightfully so. Yeah, and I think, um, personally, I think I would like to see um, a little bit of a more firm stance on what I know they think. But... Um, they're, they're not going to do that. Um, I mean, uh, as regulators, uh, they're they're doing the regulator thing, and you know we're 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 lucky they didn't get captured at best. Um, most of most of your uh, you know analysis, is, you know, though was presented in you know more of a um, you know mutually exclusive um, type of um, scenario. You know, either this or that. And, you know, I think it probably needs to be a whole lot more yes ands. Uh, as far as how this this work is it needs to be done, I think one of the reasons why 
um, they've done a bunch of nothing is, is, is because they've, they've gone through this process saying, well, we could do this or we could do that. We could do this or we could do that. I think they need to do, um, you know, a little bit of many things. Um, we, but regarding the analysis uh, on, um, you know, w whether Vermont has done any harm, I mean, we could be talking about truth and reconciliation, which is really um, just a response to our reparations bill because they didn't really want to have that conversation. Um, and even if they do have the conversation to tie it to this, I think is is actually um, kind of a, a fool's errand at best um, because, you know, again, you know, what, we we know the harm. I mean, I got a bookshelf full of books of you know that 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 tells us you know the harm that has been done, and I, and we and we've also largely acknowledged it already, um, legislatively and in some ways um, on the executive side, evidenced by your your position. I, I think that that there's a you know there's this um, you know what I'm looking at here anyway. This is just my opinion, and shoot me if if it sounds kind of off base. Uh, is is you know. <laughs> this this whole silly idea that somehow or another that that we um in a state that was 0.4 percent black when i first arrived uh 15 years ago that that we're just going to look and see how vermont has harmed black people understanding that nearly every black person in vermont came from somewhere else is just ludicrous uh and and understanding that oh by the way uh the legacy of slavery in Vermont is is the legacy of slavery in Alabama because it is the United States. Uh, I don't know I don't know what people are smoking in the state house, and I hope we're still being recorded. Um, but that's that that's just bad math. It just doesn't make any sense to even consider an analysis like that. So hopefully, what we what we'll do is, is take to them quantitative and qualitative analysis that's based on uh, what we've already come to a legislative conclusion on in terms of the legislative intent on the establishment of this body and the work that's related to this body and all in many of the other um, legislative uh, decisions that we've made to include land as access opportunity health uh, health equity uh, commission and so on and so forth so um I think that I, I hope that the report that y'all provide is bolstered uh, with with again, quantitative and qualitative, as well as friendly reminders of what the legislature has already committed to. Mark, I think what's going to happen is that the report, none of us, well, I shouldn't say none of us, but uh, most of us are not capable of doing either qualitative or quantitative work. That will come up. The recommendation is certainly something that we we'll be looking at making and given that this is open-ended i i mean i feel like i think we've got your point and i think we're gonna go from there if you're okay i mean do you feel like where are you i got nothing further to add i appreciate you giving me the time i'm gonna go eat okay. dinner <laughs> all right take care and thank you have a great night y'all you too. Be well. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for staying. And I will talk to you all soon. All right. All right. Thanks. Have fun. Bye.